Welcome to the channel. Today we have a surprising and exciting story that you cannot miss. Imagine living a near-death experience and coming across none other than Elvis Presley in hell. This spiritual journey of revelations brings powerful lessons about life, love, and the afterlife. Before we start, let us know where you are watching in the comments and if you are not yet subscribed, take the opportunity to subscribe to the channel and turn on notifications so you don't miss any incredible stories like this. My name is Celestine Harrow and I never imagined I would be here telling this story. Whenever someone asks me to talk about what happened, I feel butterflies in my stomach, like I'm about to relive it all over again. I'm an ordinary person, working as a financial advisor in New York, but I was born and raised in rural Oregon, a place where the sky seems bigger and the stars shine brighter. Before all this happened, I was that kind of person completely immersed in work. My Manhattan apartment was more of a repository of papers and reports than a proper home. I remember my mother would always say on the phone, Celestine, you need to slow down. And I would respond with that know-it-all tone, Mom, that's how things work in New York. My morning started at 5.30 a.m. with the annoying sound of the alarm clock. Strong coffee, impeccable suit, high heels and off I went for another day of endless meetings and endless spreadsheets. You're a machine, Celestine my boss used to say, as if it were the ultimate compliment. And I smiled, proud of that title that makes me think so much today. But do you know when life decides it's time for you to learn a lesson? That's exactly what happened to me. I am not a spiritual guru. I have not written books on the subject, nor have I created study groups. I'm just someone who had an extraordinary experience and feels like I need to share it. As my father always said, stories are gifts we need to pass on. It was a Tuesday in October, 1998. I remember it exactly because we were in a crucial meeting with our biggest client. I was in the middle of a presentation when my cell phone started vibrating insistently. Normally, I would have ignored it, but something told me to answer it. Excuse me, I muttered, leaving the room. My mother's voice on the other end was different, choked. Celestine, you need to sit down. Mom, I'm in the middle of a meeting. What happened? It's your father. The tests. The doctor just confirmed it. It's lung cancer. The world stopped. Literally. The people passing through the office hallway seemed to move in slow motion. The noise of the city outside was muted. My hands were shaking so much I could barely hold the phone. What I... What's the internship? Advanced, dear. The doctor said we need to begin treatment immediately. I returned to the meeting room like a robot. My boss realized something was wrong and took over the presentation. I sat there, looking at those graphs and numbers that seemed so important minutes ago and now meant absolutely nothing. That night, alone in my apartment, I started to organize my things to travel to Oregon, but then the phone rang again. It was Mark, my supervisor. Celestine, I'm sorry about your father, but we need you to stay. The Johnson Project can't wait, and so my torment began. The distance between New York and Oregon has never seemed so great. We hired a caregiver, Sarah, who became my eyes and ears. She called me three times a day to give updates. Your dad asked for you again today, Sarah told me on one of the calls. He understands that you can't come right now, but his eyes light up when I say your name. Aquilo destroyed me inside. During those difficult days, memories began to emerge at the most unexpected times. It was as if my brain was determined not to let me forget who my father really was. I remember being on the subway, on my way to work, when I suddenly found myself six years old, it was a sunny Saturday, and my father was teaching me how to ride a bike in the backyard. I can still hear your crystal clear voice. Don't look down, princess. Always look ahead. That's where you want to get. But dad, what if I fall? Then I'll be here to help you up. Always. He ran alongside the bike and holding the seat, while I alternately shouted, Don't let go, and let go, dad. When I finally managed to pedal alone, her proud smile lit up the entire yard. One afternoon, during a coffee break at the office, a colleague commented about fishing with her dad, and I was instantly transported to our Sunday fishing trips. Oliver Harrow was a patient man, especially at these times. He taught me how to tie each knot in the thread with the precision of a craftsman. See that line, Celestine? It's like life. Sometimes you need to tie knots to keep things together, but each knot needs to be tied carefully. Too tight and it snaps. Too loose and it misses what's important. On nights when the guilt of being away kept me from sleeping, I replayed the scene from my first day of school, 
I was terrified, clinging to his legs, refusing to enter the school. He knelt down in front of me, adjusted my crooked pigtails and said, Do you know why people are afraid, honey? I shook my head, still sniffling, because they forget that they are stronger than they think. You are a harrow, and harrows don't let fear win. You may feel afraid, but you will face it anyway. One morning, Sarah called me earlier than usual. Celestine, your father had a rough night. He spent hours looking through an old photo album and repeating stories about you. What stories? Sarah, he told me about the time you broke your arm when you were nine, trying to catch the baseball that had fallen on the roof. He said that even though your arm was in a cast, you insisted on being in the school play. I swallowed hard. I had completely forgotten about this episode. He said that's when he knew you would be unstoppable in life. Oh, my daughter turns obstacles into stepping stones, he said. Her words hit me like a punch in the gut. While I was there, stuck in meetings and presentations, my father was reliving our life together. It was like he was trying to tell me something, preparing me for what was to come. The week had been hell. Three major clients threatening to leave the company, two important presentations rescheduled at the last minute, and the news about my father getting worse by the day. On Friday, I got home around 11 p.m. after a particularly tense meeting. I remember Sarah had called earlier. He's weaker today, Celestine. He asked if you'd come over for the weekend. I, I have an important presentation on Monday. Maybe next, Celestine, she interrupted me, her voice soft but firm. I don't know if there will be a next weekend. Those words echoed in my head as I opened the apartment door. I didn't even bother to turn on the lights. I threw the folder on the couch and went straight to the kitchen, looking for a glass and that bottle of wine that I saved for special occasions. I had barely eaten during the day, a hastily sandwich for lunch and a few cups of coffee. That's when I felt it. It started as a slight dizziness, the kind you get when you stand up too quickly. But it was different. The world began to spin in a strange way, as if it were being sucked into a giant drain. Something is wrong, I thought, trying to reach the phone on the kitchen counter. My legs felt like they were made of jelly. I tried to lean on the wall, but my hands no longer responded to my brain's commands. The last thing I remember was the sound of the wine glass shattering on the floor and a crystal clear thought, Father, forgive me for not being there. After that, total darkness. But it wasn't scary darkness. It was like falling into a deep, peaceful sleep, the kind you don't want to wake up from. The first thing I noticed when I opened my eyes was the smell of lavender. It was the same perfume my mother grew in the garden at our home in Oregon. For a moment, I thought I'd dreamed it all. The move to New York, my father's illness, the fall in the kitchen. But then I realized it was in the backyard of the house where I grew up. Only, different. It's hard to explain exactly what was different. The colors were more vivid, more real than reality itself. The sky was a shade of blue I'd never seen before, and the grass beneath my feet seemed to emit its own soft light. Every leaf on the old apple tree shined as if it had morning dew, even though there was no dew. It was then that I heard footsteps behind me. Before I even turned around, I knew who I was. He knew that way of walking, the slight shuffle of his left foot, the result of an old injury playing baseball in college. But when I turned around, I wasn't prepared for what I saw. There was my father, Oliver Harrow, wearing that black leather jacket he loved so much. He wasn't the cancer-debilitated father I'd seen in the last photos Sarah had sent. He was the father of my childhood, strong and vibrant, with that special sparkle in his blue eyes that always made me feel like everything would be okay. Dad, my voice came out as a whisper. He smiled in that characteristic way of his, with the right corner of his mouth rising first. Hello, princess. But how, how, are you better than ever? He added, opening his arms. I ran to him like I did when I was a kid. The hug. How to describe that hug? It was as if all the love in the universe was concentrated in that moment. There was no pain. There was no guilt. There was no fear. Just absolute, complete peace. I'm sorry. I started to say through tears. I'm sorry for not being there, for putting work ahead, for... He gently placed his hand on my face. The way he did when I was little and too nervous to sleep. Shh. There's nothing to apologize for, sweetheart. Every path we choose has its purpose. You needed this journey as much as I needed mine. But Dad, I should have been there. You've always been, Celestine. In every call, in every thought, in every prayer. Besides, 
He smiled again. You're here now, aren't you? I looked around again, trying to understand. Now where exactly is Nihiras, Dad? A place between places, he replied, his eyes shining with new knowledge. A moment between moments. Come, I want to show you something. When my father reached out his hand, I noticed something strange. There was a kind of soft light emanating from both of us. It was as if every cell of our being was dimly lit. What's going on? I asked, fascinated by the glow that seemed to dance across our skin. I'd were getting ready for a little trip, he replied with that playful tone he used when he was about to surprise me with something special. Suddenly, I felt a strange sensation, as if I were being enveloped by a warm draft. But it wasn't quite air. It was more like pure, living, conscious energy. We began to rise, not sharply or frighteningly, but gently, as if we were being carried by a gentle wave. Dad, I'm... I'm a little scared, I admitted, squeezing his hand. Remember what I always told you about fear? I smiled, remembering that it's normal to feel, but we can't let it stop us. Exactly. Now, look, the world we knew was left behind. It was like watching a movie in reverse and fast forward at the same time. I saw clouds, stars, and then something completely new. A city has begun to materialize in front of us, but calling it a city is like calling the Grand Canyon a hole in the ground. It oversimplifies something indescribable. Each structure seemed to be made of crystallized light. The buildings, I don't know if I can call them that, had colors that don't exist on Earth, colors that I have no words to describe. And there was music, not from a specific place, but from everywhere. It was as if the environment itself was singing a melody that made every atom of my being vibrate in harmony. Is, is this what people call heaven? I asked, amazed. My father laughed softly. It's one of the stops on the way, a place where we can see things as they really are. As we floated or walked, it was hard to tell. I noticed that there were other beings around us. Some looked like people. Others were forms of pure light. Everyone emanated a sense of peace and purpose that was almost palpable. Each of them has their own story, my father explained, noticing my interest. Some are just passing through, like us. Others, well, let's just say they work here. Do they work? Like, angels? Before he could respond, a more intense light began to approach us. It was so bright that under normal circumstances it would have hurt my eyes. But here, in that state, I could look directly at it. The approaching light began to take shape, if I may use that word. It was a being of pure energy, but somehow, it could perceive features that resembled a human figure. He exuded such deep, unconditional love that it made me cry instantly. Welcome, said a voice that seemed to come from all directions at once. It was as if thousands of voices were speaking in unison, but it still sounded gentle and welcoming. My father made a small bow. Is she ready? Yes, replied the being of light. Celestine, would you like to see something special? I could only nod, still too emotional to speak. The being, which I now understood to be an angel, guided us to a circular room. In the center was a round table made of what appeared to be liquid crystal, and on it, a huge book that emitted its own light. It's your father's book of life, the angel explained, noticing my curiosity. The pages began to move on their own, and images appeared in the air above the book, as if they were ultra-realistic holographic projections. I saw my father at a very young age, helping an elderly woman during a storm. He not only held her umbrella for her to cross the street, but walked her home, ensuring she arrived safely. I never knew that, I muttered. There is much we do not know about those we love, replied the angel. Watch. Another scene formed. My father, in his small building material store, serving a clearly distressed man. The man explained that his house had been partially destroyed by a fire, and he had no money for repairs. Take what you need, I heard my father say in memory. You can pay me when you can, but Mr. Harrow, this could take months. Everyone deserves a safe roof over their head. Now go, your family is waiting. The scenes continue to unfold. My father donating anonymously to keep the only rural school in the region open, consoling an employee who had lost a child, always stopping to listen to anyone who needed to vent. Ah, uh, Dad, I turned to him tears in my eyes. Why didn't you ever tell me about these things? He smiled softly. True good needs no audience, dear. When we help someone expecting recognition, we diminish the value of the act. The angel made a gesture and the images changed. 
Now I saw moments of my own life with my father, him teaching me to read, healing my bad knees, comforting me after my first broken heart. Every act of love leaves an eternal mark, explained the angel. Even the smallest gestures of kindness create ripples that continue to reverberate long after we're gone. Like, like waves on a lake, I asked. Exactly, my father replied. And sometimes these waves touch people we don't even know. See, the next image showed one of the men my father had helped, years later, doing the same for another family in need. I'm just paying back what Mr. Harrow did for me, he would say. I stood there, observing that web of kindness that my father had woven throughout his life. It was as if each small act of kindness was a thread of light, connecting people, changing lives in ways he himself never knew. That's what really matters, Celestine, my father said softly. Not the numbers on a bank account or the titles on a business card, but the lives we touch, the love we share. I was about to respond when I felt a change in the environment. The light began to flicker, and a strange feeling came over me. What's going on? I asked, alarmed. The angel and my father exchanged meaningful glances. There is one more thing you need to see, said the angel, but it will be different from what we have seen so far. The change was abrupt and disconcerting. One moment I was in that heavenly room, enveloped in light and love. The next I felt like I was being pulled down by an invisible force. My father's hand still held mine, but now his touch seemed to be the only thing keeping me from being completely swallowed by the darkness. Father, I called, my voice shaking. I'm here, princess. Don't be afraid. Some lessons can only be learned in the dark. The environment around us was the complete antithesis of what we had just experienced. If before there had been golden light and heavenly music, now there were dense shadows and a heavy silence, broken only by distant whispers that sounded like laments. Where? Where are we? The angel, who was still accompanying us, although his light was more contained, replied, This is a place of transition. Some call it purgatory, others a lower dimension, but it is not what many imagine as eternal hell. As my eyes adjusted to the dim light, I began to make out shapes. They were people, or rather, souls. Some wandered aimlessly, others seemed stuck in repetitive cycles of regret. It was then that I saw something, or rather, someone, that made me doubt my own senses. Is that Elvis Presley? confirmed the angel. Yes, that's him. The King of Rock was sitting alone on what looked like a piano bench, but there was no piano. His expression was one of deep melancholy, so different from the charismatic image the world knew. Can, can I talk to him? The angel nodded, and we approached. Elvis looked up, and I could see the full weight of regret in his eyes. You're new here, he said, his voice still maintaining that characteristic timbre, although softer and sadder. I'm just passing through, I replied. But why are you here? You've brought so much joy to so many people. He gave a wistful smile. Fame is a cruel master, darling. I had everything money could buy, but I lost what really mattered along the way. I wasted my gifts. I sank into addictions. I hurt people who loved me. Now I'm here, learning lessons that I should have learned in life. But, is this forever? The angel intervened. Nothing here is eternal, Celestine. This is a place of reflection and transformation. Each soul has its own time of learning. It's true, Elvis agreed. Every day I feel the weight of my choices but I also feel like I'm changing. One day, when I'm ready, I'll be able to move forward. As we talked, I noticed other famous souls, some I recognized from history books, others from magazines and newspapers. They all seemed to be at different stages of a deep process of self-reflection. See that faint light up there? My father pointed to a distant point above us. It's hope. It's always there, even in the darkest places. No one is truly lost. But how does anyone know when they're ready to get out of here? I asked. When they truly learn their lessons, replied the angel. When regret turns to understanding and guilt to acceptance, it's not a punishment, Celestine. It's an opportunity for growth. Elvis stood up, his face a little lighter. Tell people, tell them that what matters is not the applause. It's not the fame. It's not the money. It's what you do with the time you have. It's how you treat people along the way. I felt tears streaming down my face. It was a sadness unlike any other I had ever experienced. It wasn't personal. It was a kind of universal empathy for all those souls in their process of transformation. It's time for us to go, said the angel softly. 
There is one more thing you need to see before you return. We left that dark place the same way we entered it, through a transition that made my stomach turn. When I opened my eyes again, we were in a different space, neither the city of light from the beginning, nor the darkness we had just left. It was like being inside a lucid dream, where everything seemed both real and ethereal at the same time. Where are we now? I asked, still holding my father's hand tightly. In the place of possibilities, replied the angel. Here, you can see some glimpses of what's to come. A series of images began to form around us, as if we were inside a bubble of memories. Only these were memories of the future. I saw my mother, older but with a special sparkle in her eyes, arranging flowers in a small store. It was the flower shop she always dreamed of. Is she going to be okay? I asked my father, my voice breaking. More than fine, he smiled. Or she will discover a strength she didn't even know she had, and you will help her on this journey. Another image formed. Myself, a few years older, talking to people, helping them in a different way than I did at the bank. There was a piece on my face that I didn't recognize in the present. But what about my work? The career I built? My father laughed softly. Who said you have to choose? Sometimes our greatest contribution comes from combining different aspects of who we are. The angel made a gesture and the images changed again. I found myself mentoring young professionals, using my financial experience to help people find balance between professional and personal success. See, said my father, your experiences, even the painful ones, have a purpose. I then realized that I was beginning to feel a slight vibration, as if something was calling me back. It's almost time, said the angel. No, I exclaimed, gripping my father's hand tighter. Not yet. There's so much I want to ask, so much I need to know. My father pulled me into a hug, and at that moment I felt all the love of a lifetime condensed into a single gesture. My little Celestine, he said, his voice full of emotion. You've always been stronger than you think. Remember when you were seven and scared of the dark? I nodded, tears flowing freely. What did I tell you that night? That, that the dark only exists to show us how special the light is. Exactly. And that's what you need to remember now. Every difficult moment, every challenge, every goodbye. It's just intervals between lights. But how will I go on without you, Dad? He held my face in his hands, like he did when I was little. Who said you'll be without me? I'll be in every happy memory, in every lesson learned, in every moment you choose love over fear. The angel approached. Celestine, before you leave, there is one last thing your father wants to show you. My father took something out of his jacket. It was a small music box, just like the one that sat on my bedside table as a child. Remember this song? He asked, opening the box. A soft melody began to play. It was Somewhere Over the Rainbow, the song he used to sing me to sleep. Whenever you feel homesick, he said, close your eyes and listen. The music is always playing, even if we can't always hear it. The vibration was getting stronger now and I could feel my time was running out. Dad, I love you. I'm sorry for... Shh, he interrupted me gently. There's nothing to apologize for. Just promise that you will live, really live. Promise that you will love without fear, that you will help others find their light, that you will remember that every day is a gift. I promise, I whispered, feeling myself starting to distance myself. And Celestine, he called, his voice already sounding distant. Remember, love never dies. It just changes form. The first sensation was pain, a sharp physical pain that seemed to course through every inch of my body. Sounds gradually returned. First the rhythmic beeping of heart monitors, then muffled voices, and finally, the characteristic noise of a busy hospital. She's coming back, I heard someone say. I opened my eyes slowly, the fluorescent light of the hospital feeling extremely harsh after the softness I had experienced. My mother was next to me, holding my hand, her eyes red from crying. Sarah, my father's caregiver, was in the corner of the room. How, how long, I managed to mutter my throat dry as paper. Almost 48 hours, honey, my mother replied, her eyes filling with tears again. You went into cardiac arrest. The doctors, they almost lost you twice. I tried to sit up, but my body protested. It was then that I noticed something different on my mother's face. It wasn't just worry that I saw there. Dad, I started, but I didn't need to finish. His look said it all. It was a few hours ago, she said softly. 
He left peacefully, asleep. A nurse came into the room at that moment to check my vitals, but I barely noticed her presence. In my mind, I replayed every moment of the experience I had lived. Had it been real? Had he really stayed with my father? Was he using... I started to ask Sarah. The black jacket? She added, surprising me. Yes, he asked to be buried with her. I felt a shiver run down my spine. There was no way Sarah would have known I had seen him in that jacket. The following days were a whirlwind of doctors, exams, and funeral preparations. Many people came to say goodbye to my father, and each one had a story to tell about how he had touched their lives. The man at the hardware store he had helped after the fire, the rural school family he saved with his anonymous donations, all the stories I had seen in the Book of Life, began to emerge in real life. Six months later, I handed in my resignation letter to the bank. It wasn't an impulsive decision. It was the result of a lot of reflection and a deep certainty that there was more to life than numbers on spreadsheets. I helped my mother open her flower shop, yes, exactly as I had seen in the vision, and I started working as an independent consultant, focusing on helping people find a balance between financial success and personal fulfillment. Sometimes, when I'm alone at night, I close my eyes and I can still hear the melody from that music box. In moments like these, I feel my father's presence as strong as in that spiritual encounter. And I know, with a certainty that transcends logic, that he was right. Love never dies. It only changes form. Many people ask me why I decided to share this story. I haven't written books on the subject. I don't give lectures, nor have I created study groups. I'm just someone who's been privileged to glimpse something beyond the veil that separates this world from the next. And if there's one thing I've learned, it's that sometimes the most important stories are the ones whispered from heart to heart, not shouted from the stage. Today, when I look back, I see that that experience wasn't just about death. It was about life, about love, about the invisible connections that bind us to each other. It was about understanding that every moment is precious, every encounter is meaningful, and every act of kindness echoes for eternity. And you know that fear of the dark I had as a child? My father was right. The dark really only exists to show us how special the light is. Sometimes we need to go through moments of darkness to truly appreciate the beauty of light. And the light, oh the light is everywhere. In the smiles of the people we help, in the small everyday kindnesses, in the memories we hold in our hearts. As my father would say, life is the greatest gift we receive. Our job is to unwrap it with gratitude and share it with love. And that's what I try to do every day, one person at a time one moment at a time, always remembering that somewhere, over the rainbow, my father continues to smile and keep my path.